Well, thank you, Anthony. I want to commend you on uh, the way in which you read the word. It's uh, it's very important to read the word well with meaning, and uh, so thankful for that. I also want to say this for those who are watching in my live stream that I, I did get the memo about the dress code. I want to say that, but for the sake of our non-campers, I thought I'd try and make worship as uh, typical as possible for you streaming in. We trust this morning. Uh, the weekends are a, are a great uh, time for sport. I wish, as it was the case growing up, that the sport was on a Saturday, not the Lord's Day. It's not simply a Sunday, it's the Lord's Day. And all over the world, there will be coaches after the match uh, coming before the cameras, and they'll be asked questions about how the game has gone. And I guarantee it that somebody somewhere is going to say that it was a game of two halves. That's one of the cliches, certainly, of football, soccer. Now, back in Malaysia, I probably call it football again. A game of two halves. And Reverend David has, over these uh, uh, talks together, these sessions together, spoken about the first half. And as is sometimes the case in soccer, it's, it's not always pretty, is it? It's not always pretty for us in the first half, as it were, of our Christian lives. We're inexperienced, immature. And uh, we have embraced the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And we know in principle that he's also our Lord. But uh, it takes time, doesn't it, for the Holy Spirit to spread over our lives. The reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, as I've listened to Reverend David, I've been conscious of these two halves of Peter's life. The first in which he's struggling. He has in Christ a new nature, and yet the habits of the old nature need to be put away, whereby we stop saying no to the Lord. We start saying yes to the Lord. Of course, there's not a symmetry between the no and the yes. The no comes naturally to us. The yes is a product of the grace of God. And now we come in this final session of our church camp to consider how God worked by his spirit to spread through Peter's life the lordship of Christ over his heart. And what a transformation in the life of Peter by the time we come to 2 Peter chapter 1. It's probably 63 or 64 AD. A number of decades have passed since God first began to encounter Peter and to bring about this transformation in his life. Reverend David ended up with uh, the rebuke by the Apostle Paul to Peter to the face, which was probably 15 years before, to give you an idea. But the point that I want to leave you with is that if we are in Christ, we are works in progress. We are on a journey of growth. And it is God's will that we be holy, for as the author of Hebrews says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And so we come then to this passage, and by way of introduction, trying to connect what Reverend David has spoken of and what we're going to deal with today, we need to notice three introductory points. And this is, first of all, Peter's history. Despite his early failings, he said no to the cross. He said no to conversion. He said no to the Great Commission. Much has been done by the Spirit of God in his life. We know little about what has happened after the meeting with Cornelius. Reverend David mentioned Galatians 2, 11 to 16, and how Paul on one occasion, we're not sure which date it was exactly around the middle of the first century, Paul withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Well, what had happened? Well, he had that marvelous vision of um, the sheet coming down and that he was not to call uh, other people unclean but he was to believe that the gospel was now crossing over the boundaries of God's ancient people and the gospel coming out to to the world and yet despite that compromise that stepping back the general trajectory of Peter's life was to go forward and we notice from Acts 10, just to uh, mention several things, well, Acts 11, actually, he becomes a faithful reporter of what God was doing amongst the Gentiles. And we find in Acts uh, this wonderful statement of what God had been doing, how that the Gentiles had 
received the gospel. Acts chapter 11, verse 18. When they heard these things, this report from Peter, they fell silent. They glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. It's hard for us to get inside the dynamics of the Jewish and Gentile world of that day, but they are, they are massively shocked. But they are also rejoicing that the good news of the gospel is not just for us. It's for all the world. And so he was a faithful reporter. And then we also see from Acts 12 that he became a faithful sufferer. We read there that Herod, wanting to please the Jews, arrested Jesus. It's very easy, arrested Peter. It's very easy to say that, isn't it? But uh, this is the third time in the Acts of the Apostles he's been arrested. We would think him a hero if he'd been arrested once for the sake of the gospel, but this is his third time of being arrested. And yet he was miraculously rescued. And then we come to Acts 15, and he was a faithful contender. You see, the circumcision party, as we heard at the end of the last session, they wanted to say, well, Gentiles can come into the church on two conditions. Well, you see, they've got to be circumcised, and they've got to obey the Mosaic law. We'll come back to that because what they're really destroying is the gospel. Because they're saying, well, the Gentiles can come into our church so long as they add to the justification they've received, the works. And if you add to God's perfect work, you actually subtract from it. And that's why Paul was so animated and why Peter at the Council of Jerusalem stands up, withstands the circumcision party that had been on his case, and by giving a report as to what God had been doing amongst the Gentiles through the preaching of a gospel good news, by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, he paved the way at the council for Paul and Barnabas then to stand up and to say, yes, this is indeed what God has been doing. We know the outcome of the council. Yes, we're not going to impose anything else on the Gentiles to add to their justification. They are saved the same way as everybody else is saved, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So I want to say to us with regard to Peter's history and to encourage us as we look back upon our own lives that it's not how we begin that ultimately counts, it's how we go on. And we need to remember that, especially when we think of how we have let the Lord down. Those occasions when we have said no to Jesus, Whatever the no might be, we have refused the lordship of Christ, even at the same time, hypocritically, of receiving Christ as our Savior. As I've said to you before, we receive the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is both Savior and Lord. You can't parcel out Christ and say, well, I'll take that, and I won't take that. It's about like lining up for lunch. Well, I'll have a bit of that, and I'll have a bit of that, and I'll leave that. No, faith in Christ takes the whole Christ, the one who is both Savior and Lord. And I'm sure the Apostle Peter could say in the words, that famous quote from John Newton, I'm not what I should be, I'm not what I could be, I'm not what I shall be hereafter, but I'm not what I once was, and what I am, I am by the grace of God. So these years have passed. The Spirit has been doing a marvelous work in the life of Peter. And for all his faults and failings, we come to an inspiring understanding of how Peter's life played out. And so notice then, secondly, by way of introduction, Peter's humility, verse 1. Simeon, or Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter, we recall, had a habit of getting above himself. I can understand that. Look at the great privileges that he had. He was personally called by the Lord Jesus while he was fishing. He was part of Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He was present for the transfiguration. He was the one who was present on the day of Pentecost, who had the privilege of preaching that first New Covenant sermon in which 3,000 people were converted. I can imagine if 3,000 people were converted under a sermon of mine, that would be pretty, pretty uh, easy for that to go to my head. If only. Not if only that it would go to my head. 
But if only that 3,000 people were converted. And yet, over the process, you see, grace is, is a process of going downward. It's like a donkey's tail. The more it grows, the lower the ground it gets. That's what we're told. And that's, if we've been any time in the Christian faith, we know that to be the case. And so what had happened? Well, remember how the Lord, the first time he tried to stop Jesus going to the cross, from Mark's account, uh, Jesus turns around to him and says, get behind me, Satan. Huh. Well, of course, he wasn't calling Peter Satan, but he was saying that Satan was operative through him to try to get him from going to the cross. And the Lord speaking truth in love, slaps him down. And then, of course, he, he goes, uh, trusting in his own strength. When Jesus is arrested, he goes and he sits with the guards to see how it all plays out. And then he's tripped up by a series of servant girls. And is it Matthew who tells us that he denied Jesus with an oath? And he calls upon curses to come upon himself. And then... We come back to the three no's and the withstanding to the face of the Apostle Paul. This has been very humbling. So when we come into verse 1, notice the humility that he now has. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. That's the first indication of his humility. Notice that he, he doesn't put the apostleship first. He puts the servanthood first. And it's as a servant of Jesus Christ, he has been called to serve as an apostle, one of the foundational offices of the Church of the New Covenant era. Now, I've traveled many times now to Africa, and I'm not going to say to you this morning something I haven't said many times in Africa. Stop calling yourself an apostle. Unless you were present with Jesus from the beginning to the time he was taken up, stop calling yourself an apostle. You see, what happened was the colonial powers left Africa, and instead of the African church saying, we need a different way of looking at the organization of the church and the organization of society, they bought into the colonial mindset of the masters and the underlings. And so you have every Tom, Dick, and Harry, it seems, in Africa claiming to be an apostle without the signs of the apostles. And yet here is somebody who was a real apostle says Simon Peter, servant of Jesus Christ, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And the other indication of his humility, notice how verse 1 plays out. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Here's a man who had been contending for the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That a person is justified in the eyes of God by the life of Christ, by the death of Christ, and not by the works of the law. And so now he applies it pastorally to those who he's writing, and he says to those who obtained a faith of equal standing. You see his pastoral nous, as we'd call it. He's building bridges with those to whom he's reading. He says, listen, I'm not out of, out of touch with you. I'm, I'm the apostle and you're the underlings. He says, this is what we have in the gospel that binds us together as writer and reader. And so I ask us this morning, do we understand the doctrine of justification by faith alone? Do we understand what that means as a church family? Now let me point to our dear sister in Christ. The, I won't give her name, but she was baptized on August the 28th. I believe she became a believer 2022-2021. I became a believer in August 1981. Now, who is more justified in the eyes of God? What would you answer? Who's the one more justified? The 40-year-old believer? Or the brand new believer? Well, what is Peter saying? Of equal standing. That's the beauty of justification by faith alone. That the younger saint here is as justified in the sight of God as the older saint. And Peter loves to make that point, and so we see his humility. You see, grace instills within us humility. Humility is not self-disparagement, woe is me, and running down all the gifts that God has given us. Rather, it is a desire to lift up others. And so the apostle Peter, being 
made humble by the work of the Holy Spirit, submitting him to the Lordship of Christ, he says, yes, I'm an apostle, but first I'm a servant. Yes, I'm an apostle, but I have equal standing with God under the righteousness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The third element of the introduction, Peter's heart, verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. A year previously, he'd written 1 Peter. And you will know if you have an awareness of that uh, epistle, that when he comes to the end of the epistle, he says this, I exhort the elders among you as fellow elder and as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God. And so now, a year or so later, as he opens this epistle, he gives this salutation. And I am more and more convinced when we read the salutations of the New Testament, we tend to think of them just as niceties whereby a letter is opened. But I think there's a context to these salutations. And here he is shepherding the people to whom he's writing. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. It's a warm sentiment, but it's much more than that. He's going to remind us that the knowledge of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, is the key factor in our growth to maturity. And so notice then the way the salutation goes. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. We want to say, don't we, that this knowledge is not simply intellectual. You cannot have a saving faith in Jesus Christ without having that intellectual knowledge of the gospel. But saving faith is so much more than simply what's in our head. It's what sinks down by the Holy Spirit into our hearts and is outworked in our wills. And so it's intellectual, but it's also spiritual. So against this backdrop then, Peter owns his own submission to the Lord, and he now teaches his readers three critical factors in their own growth in Christ. The first critical factor then is divine power, verses 3 and 4. He's just referred to God. And Peter now boldly proclaims that God who has the power to save us also has the power to keep us and the power to grow us. And while I'm sure I'm not alone, I can resonate, I can, I can enter into Peter's sandals, the one who failed and failed and failed. When I look at the second half of Peter's life, I am massively inspired by what he says here. And by the God who takes hold of a man who failed in order for him to communicate pastorally to those who need to grow and mature in Christ. And so this he says, God's power, the power that created the universe, the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the Holy Spirit being given to us so that God who first saved us from our sins, that we should be forgiven, also has the power, has the capacity to make us what he commands us to be, and that is to be godly in his sight. And so notice four details about this divine power. First of all, the purpose, the opening words of verse 3. He has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He hasn't given us his power so that we might be greedy, that we might bring before God our carnal, temporal, material wish list, the priority of God is that we should have life and godliness. So I believe the NIV puts it, godly life. Now remember how Christ, while he was with us, said he came that we might have life to the full, John 10.10. 10. But some of us are wondering, and I've been there too, well, well, where's this abundant life? Where's this abundant life I was promised? All the while tolerating this area, safeguarding this area, whereby I'm Lord of my life, tolerating what the Puritans call these darling sins. And then we wonder, well, where's the abundant life? God has broken his promise. God has broken his promise. 
when the reality is that we've been given this divine power for life and for godliness, for all things that pertain to life and godliness, but we are yet to appropriate rightly that divine power. What is the godliness? Well, it's piety, it's devotion, it's reverence. And so Peter's readers embrace the knowledge, and I trust we have if we profess faith in Christ, that if I am converted, then I must go on to be godly. But they need to know that God has the power to do within them what they are commanded to be. Hence, our encouragement by the divine power. You know, I first learned this in difficult circumstances. Uh, when I was 17, uh, I remember the night we went to the neurological hospital in Liverpool. And uh, we knew that my father had had tests that day. And we entered the room. I can picture the scene now. There he was lying on the bed in a dressing gown. I didn't know what to expect. And we walked in there. And uh, uh, mum said to dad, well, what have they said about the tests? Well, they said I've, I've got multiple sclerosis. A benign form of it didn't turn out not to be so benign. And so as a teenager, I had the privilege of observing my father at close quarters, the man he was before the diagnosis, the man he was after the diagnosis. I had been professing to be a Christian for two years, and frankly, I had not a clue about this whole notion of godliness and holiness. I was as a, a teenager full of angst, waiting for holiness to descend upon me at some unsuspecting moment, and hey, presto, I be holy. I now know that we call that quietism where you passively wait for God to do what only God can do. And so as I was uh, lying in my bed morning by morning, with my head under the pillows, miserable as sin, not knowing why the Christian life wasn't turning out as I thought it would be, I could hear my father coming up the stairs while he could still climb the stairs every morning. And it was so irritating. It was like the the alarm clock which sounds good once or twice and then you want to throw the phone at the wall and he would come up same thing every day with a cup of tea it was britain wakey wakey rise and shiny off to school you go same thing every day and he would pull across the curtains the sun would come in oh another day and i got thinking how how is this possible? How is this possible that I'm a teenager, healthy, full of life, miserable as sin, claimed Christ, and here's my father also claims Christ, got a debilitating disease, struggling to climb the steps, open the windows, wakey, wakey, rise and shine, off to work you go, off to school you go. And then over a period of months as this kept happening, Ah, oh, I get it. I get it. There's no true happiness in the Christian life without holiness. So, I was aided by the Holy Spirit to reason, if I pursue holiness, I might actually become happy. I thought holiness was such a drudgery. I didn't really want to be holy. I didn't really want Jesus to be Lord of my life. And that in some sense, this was as important, significant in my life as the actual conversion experience. So notice the second half of verse 3, the purpose of the divine power. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Whereas verse 2 in the original literally says, in the knowledge of the Father and Son, we have received grace and peace. In other words, upon Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, we now have a personal knowledge of God once and for all. Here in verse 3, it's through the knowledge of the Father that life and godliness develops. Specifically, the knowledge of God teaches us that we've been called of God. Called not simply to know our sins forgiven, but called to be godly. And either here Peter writes, as it is in the NIV, that by the Father's glory... 
we are called, or by the call of God, as in the ESV, we display the glory and the excellence of God by becoming godly. So either way, God's power flows through the knowledge of the God who calls us unto himself. So the question came to us earlier, uh, what's, what's the role of uh, a fellowship group? Well, it is to confirm the importance of knowing God, not simply intellectually, but also experientially. And as we come through the knowledge of God, we actually get to display the character of God by what he does in us. So notice, thirdly then, about the divine power, the promises, verse 4 by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. The knowledge of God is so powerful because it teaches us not only that God has called us, but that this God who is so great and above what we are has nevertheless given us these precious and very great promises. We can say, These promises are many, and these promises are profound. They remind us, in the words of the church, Father Augustine, that God gives us what he commands. You know, during those days of learning that there's no happiness without holiness, I began, under the influence of Christian friends, start reading Christian books. I thought that was only what elderly Christians do. And I bought a few books. One of them was a book, a classic book, J.C. Ryle, Holiness. And I want to encourage you to read Christian books. And I only remember two things about that book, but two things that have stayed with me ever since. He kept coming back to this phrase, the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And he kept coming back to this verse. Blessed is the person who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I clung on to that, that word, shall. Okay, that's a promise. All right. I'm being along into the Lord. That's what I profess. And this is one of the many and great promises that God has made, that if I hunger and thirst after righteousness, I shall be filled. It was life transforming. So the problem of a want of godliness in our lives lies in our failure to appropriate God's promises. And so the session comes to you and the session says, would you like to serve in this capacity? You say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not godly enough. I'm not godly enough. Well, the supplementary question comes back then. Why are you not godly enough? You see, that's not an excuse. God has given you divine power to appropriate the promises of God that you may be the person God is calling you to be. That doesn't mean perfection, as we saw in the Q&A. That means coming regularly with your confessions and seeking God for grace so that gradually you may be filled. Gradually the Holy Spirit will spread across your life the Lordship of Christ, and so We serve as works in progress, but we serve because God is making us godly. So the fourth thing about the divine power is the partaking. Second half of verse 4. So that through them, these great, many precious promises, we may become partakers of the divine nature. Now that's a complicated phrase, but notice what Peter is saying, or not saying rather. When he mentions the divine nature, he is not saying that we partake of the divine persons, that is, become gods. He's saying we partake of the divine nature, which is different. In other words, we partake of the very characteristics of God, and thereby reflecting him in some measure, we begin to live with the authority which God has given to us. And so notice the other thing, his mention of the world. We attain godliness not by escaping the world, but by escaping its evil. You see, one of the problems with regard to holiness in the life of the church was the whole movement of asceticism in the early centuries. And there was a man called Simeon Stylites. And he lived on top of a pole with a platform for 17 years, thinking he could escape the evil that was in the world. 
And when his mother died, they held a funeral for his mother. And on the way to the funeral, apparently, they brought her body underneath the platform so he could see his dead mother. Well, that doesn't seem very godly to me. We're not here to escape the world, but having this divine power within us, we can live in the world without being of the world. And it's by living in the world, escaping the corruptions of the world, that we demonstrate that God is at work within us. Divine power. Well, let me come more briefly then to the second critical factor in our growth, diligent practice, verses 5 to 11. Peter now balances divine sovereignty with human responsibility. And it's precisely because of God's power flowing to us that we make every effort, verse 5, to pursue godliness. Notice that this effort has three godly traits which are mentioned here in these verses. The first is supplementing, verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. I'm pondering the meaning in the Greek of that word to supplement or to add. When you look at the Greek word for that, it's very close to this. Choreographing upon. And so we may say whether that's actually what the Greek is trying to do there, that the Christian life is like building upon a foundation of faith. So here we have a platform. The platform is faith. And once you become a Christian, you start choreographing your life on the platform of faith. And what is choreographing? It is putting in place a series or a sequence of steps or movements. And the Apostle Peter mentions seven of them. Let us run through them briefly. Virtue. It's the same word as excellence in verse 3, or goodness or uprightness, which is attributed to God. You see the idea of becoming like the character of God. Knowledge. Yes, we needed knowledge in order to come to the faith. But once we are in the faith, we become a lifelong learner. Self-controlled. Controlled by the promises of God and not by the passions of the flesh. Steadfastness, or what the NIV puts as perseverance. Godliness, devotion or reverence. Brotherly affection, being literally Philadelphians. David knows something like that, although having lived north of Philadelphia, to say Philadelphia is not always known for his brotherly love. And love, agape self-sacrificial love so all these things are being choreographed and much more besides on the platform of faith so we come back to this idea then that these virtues are not what grant us salvation but they are a result of being saved they are a result of being in relationship to jesus christ and then peter says verses eight to nine increasing for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. He's saying if we have genuine faith, these steps, these movements, what the ESV calls these qualities, have literally come into existence and are increasing. In other words, we gain more evidences of faith as the Spirit spreads over our lives, the Lordship of Christ, and we have more of each of these qualities. And where this is so, we're kept. First of all, we're kept from falling, or f falling, verse 8. We're kept from becoming ineffective, literally idle or inactive, unfruitful or worse. Remember how David in the psalm, Psalm 69, his great fear, and this is the great fear of those who are pursuing godliness. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me, O Lord God of hosts. Let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, O God of Israel. 
See, one of the reasons we pursue godliness, we pursue these qualities, is so that we wouldn't let down the Lord. And so we are kept from falling. And then verse 9, we are kept from forgetting. In making these moves, we're motivated by the sins and consequences that were ours. And when we forget from what we've been cleansed, the blindness of the world creeps back over us. We lose our perception. You can't lose your salvation. But have you noticed if you've been backslidden in your own life or if you've seen or witnessed someone becoming backslidden, the blindness, the darkness that hovers over the world begins to creep back over a believer. They lose their perception. Two and two does no longer seem to make four to them. And then the third godly trait is practicing verses 10 and 11. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here, Peter draws together three concepts, three ideas, three themes, which he's already mentioned. Brotherhood, verse 7. Diligence, verse 5. Calling, verse 3. But he traces the, our incentives one step further back to election. We were chosen in Christ, not simply to be saved, but to be holy. Isn't that what Paul writes in Ephesians 1 verse 4? That God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy. And so shunning idleness, shunning forgetfulness, we practice the qualities never to fall. Instead, those making every effort have a rich abundance, a rich entrance into Christ's eternal kingdom. The NIV, a rich welcome. Isn't this what the godly want? When we come to stand before God, to know that as far as we have appropriated the divine power and practiced these and many more qualities of the Christian life, we have left it all on the field. Isn't that another sporting term? They left it all on the field. That we have done what we could have by the grace of God to be a witness to God in this Life, You know, one of the prayers that I've had, I probably came to it too late, is that God would give me as little as possible to be ashamed when I stand before him. I wish I'd learned to pray that earlier. To have a rich entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And not for my salvation, but for the glory of God to be able to say, not as an entrance into heaven, but as a response to the grace received. Lord Jesus, I tried to leave it all on the field. And so the third thing that Peter writes about with regard to encouraging the pursuit of godliness is departure plans, verses 12 to 15. Peter's plea for godliness arose out of the essential importance of godliness. Uh, my father used to quote to me as a, as a teenager in those wrestling years, very stark words by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. If you claim to be a Christian and live like a worldling, you're nothing but a barefaced liar. Very stark, but very true. And so Peter understands how important godliness is to the people of God, but also understands that this is, quote-unquote, the will of a dying apostle and martyr of Jesus Christ. And so he's writing from prison. He knows that he's going to die shortly. And as he thinks about the church that's going to go on on this earth without him, he gives three reminders. First of all, verse 12, to live intentionally. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. 
Of course, knowledge is included in the pursuit of godliness. But frankly, there are times when we don't need more knowledge. What we need is more application of the knowledge that we've already got. I know that from my own Christian life. It's almost as if your knowledge gets so far ahead of where you're at in terms of practice that you say, okay, in the realm of which I've lived, I need to stop reading theology books and I need to get hold of a book about practical Christian living. I need to get hold of a book that deals with the experience of the Christian life that might not teach me anything new doctrinally, but will remind me of the person I'm meant to be. Varying your reading. And so we need to be reminded of what we already know. And it's in that reminder then that we get to be balanced Christians, balancing what we know, and we should be growing in what we know, with what we should do as God's people. What's the point of our knowledge if we are not virtuous, if we are not self-controlled, if we are not steadfast, if we are not affectionate, if we are not loving? I'm challenged by that. And so Peter comes to us this morning, if he was here preaching this message, and he would say, take hold of everything you know and ask yourself, how far am I applying it? Is there all this truth that's hanging out there that I'm not really applying to my life? I happen to know it like I know politics, like I know philosophy, like I know some other subject. But this is why we teach the Bible. This is why we have home Bible study fellowship, so that we may be applying it in the community. And how we need reminders to live intentionally. I have... Uh, a uh, dear friend who's a former senior colleague of mine, he's a church historian called Claire Davis, and he's a very witty man. He's an unusual man, but he's a very witty man. And he would stand up here with his hands in his pockets, and he would talk to you probably for about an hour and a half, and you think, where, this, where is this all going? But if you follow carefully, he goes right round the mulberry bush, and he talks about all these various things, and I remember listening to him one occasion, and as he came to the end of his speech, oh, I get it. He's coming back to where he began. I understand it. Okay, now I, can, now I can figure out the way in which he speaks. And it's wonderfully deep. It's wonderfully colorful. And he has these uh, pithy, witty sayings. This is how he describes sanctification. I've said to him, we really need to write these down. So he was... <laughs> writing Reverend David's sayings down. I collected many of them in my mind. But this is how he describes sanctification. Sanctification, the process of becoming godly, is a combination of deja vu and amnesia, but I'm not sure if I haven't said that before. <laughs> in other words, if you go through the Christian life, there are, there are parts you come to in the Christian life and you think, I think I've been here before. But I didn't remember initially being here before because I forgot the lessons I was meant to learn the first time. And so Peter says, before he comes to leave the stage, listen, you're going to get deja vu. I've been here before. You're going to get amnesia. So forgive me if I repeat things, but it needs repeating. Live intentionally. And then secondly, verses 13 and 14, live inspirationally. Here he is, he's come into the end of his days. Yes, he's made his mistakes. He's been learning from them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit or the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the influence of the Holy Spirit. And he says, my job as somebody who's going to leave the scene is not simply to teach doctrine or application. It's to give a picture to people of what it is to live a godly life. And so verses 13 and 14, he says, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, or literally this tabernacle, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. Yes, I can connect with Peter in the first half of his life, but there's nothing about Peter's life which I find so admirable as what is found in these verses. What is he speaking about? He's speaking about his restoration after he denied the Lord, and the Lord says to him in John 21:18 Truly truly I say to you 
When you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And John adds, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. So here's a man, for all his faults and failings, probably for 30 years, he's carried in his mind things that he cannot unhear. And he knows, on the one hand, that he's going to live to be an old age. That's the upside of it. The downside of it, he's going to be martyred for the faith. And his life is going to glorify God. And so here he is, all these years later, these decades later, it's still ringing in his ears. And now he's in prison, and he senses that, yes, this is when it's going to come to, come to pass, that... I'm going to be martyred for the faith. And so as long as I am in this body, as long as I am in this tabernacle, I am going to remind you of what you probably already know but need to remember. Now, few of us are called to martyrdom, so far as we know. But we each are called to leave the stage of this life inspiring others in the faith before coming to the camp we were speaking with Reverend David Ruth also I believe and remembering people who we've known in common and somebody who was a great uh, mentor to me when I was a student my name is Hugh Williams and Hugh was diagnosed with cancer and eventually died at the age of 64 and as an elder of the church, I was a politics student at the time. He used to take me under his wing, spend a lot of time with me, take me on some pastoral visits. And in the car sometimes he would give me these pastoral scenarios and say, what would you do? But then I got to see him close up after he had cancer. And I used to phone him by that time from America and um, I didn't realize how ill he was. But I do remember him saying, my people need to see me die well. And that's what Peter was talking about here. And when I later became minister of Seventh Reformed Church, we came to a church that was elderly. It's staggering for me to look back and for Brenda to look back. And each of those 10 years, we had literally 13 or 14 funerals a year of elderly saints. When I think of those who inspired us to keep on keeping on, inspired us. And so, finally, live informatively, verse 15. And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. And so, Peter wants these readers not only to remember what he said, but to remember it with clarity, to get it right. He doesn't want people distorting what he's taught. You know, there was a time at Seventh Reformed Church and um, a phone call came into the church office from a dear lady called Joyce. And uh, can I have a visit from a minister? Well, the minister. And I said, well, why does Joyce want a visit? Well, the nurse said she's, uh, she's afraid to die. So I went to see Joyce a lady who had been a communicant member of the church for 50 years. I said, Joyce, why are you afraid to die? It's a big thing. I wasn't underestimating it. She says, well, you see, I'm not sure I've done enough to get to heaven. I said, Joyce, I said, um, who ever told you you could do enough to get to heaven? Well, that's what our ministers have taught us. I said, Joyce, I'm one of your ministers. We taught you exactly the opposite of that. And it was a reminder, you know, you can sit under preaching and you can think you preached a clear sermon. And then somebody comes out and says, well, actually, this is what our ministers taught us. And I'm like, what am I paid the big bucks for? <laughs> so I said to Joyce, Joyce, no, 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 no. I shared with her the gospel. I said, listen, Joyce, it's Monday. I'll come back on Wednesday. So I came back on Wednesday. I said, Joyce, walked into a room in a retirement community. I said, tell me, and you will know the question by now. If you were to die today and God said to you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? 
when I say that Jesus has died for my sins. 50 years as a communicant member to come to that simple but profound truth. And so Peter says to him, listen, after I've gone, there's going to come a day. My head's going to be loosed from my shoulders or whatever. I want you to know not only the amount that I taught, but I want you to get it right. I want you to know that. And so here he is writing this letter at the end of his days. And this is one of the things that I have come away with encouraging. That if you get a chance to write down your spiritual journey, so that those coming after you will know with a crystal clarity why you departed from the religion of your ancestors. What was it that made you go through the rough and tumble of losing family members, of coming to believe that Jesus Christ is the only savior we could possibly have, the only savior there is, what was it? And so let's end with this. Saying yes to Jesus is by grace alone. But once we have received that grace, what a lot there is to do with it. And what a little time there is to do it in. Leave it all on the field. You know, as a young boy, our parents took us to uh, Boscombe in Bournemouth every October for a conference. It was in a Christian hotel. And uh, these lectures were going on, these sermons were going on. It was all over my head, so I thought. And so I sat there through session after session. And in the room was this statement and I pondered it year after year. We have only one life. It will soon be passed. And only what's done for Christ will last. It actually comes from a missionary, C.T. Studd, who died in 1931. He wrote this, Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart. And from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. And only what's done for Christ will last. We aim to glorify God. That's our first aim. A secondary aim is that we may have a rich entrance into the eternal kingdom. We each, in a sense, have a life of two halves if we're converted. Let's take hope from God's word for the second half, however long that might be. Let us pray. Our oh, great God and Father, we thank you for your word. And thank you for this trophy of grace, the Apostle Peter. And for all that you taught him. He could look back on days of failure, days of arrogance, days of putting his foot in his mouth. And yet, bit by bit, because he was solidly and genuinely converted, the Spirit worked in his life applying the Lordship of Christ to increasing areas of his life. And he became, by your grace, a beautiful soul, partaking in the divine nature. Father, thank you for his pastoral heart, for your people. But above all, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ of whom he spoke, the one through whom saving knowledge comes to us, and by the power of your Spirit. So we pray that you would meet us according to our needs here this morning for those who are yet to come to faith in Christ, we pray for the movement of your Holy Spirit, as we've heard this week, that the Holy Spirit would fall even in the midst of the preaching. Our Father, we pray for those who are in Christ, that having begun a good work in us, you would go on to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your divine power at work in us. We pray, Father, that we be diligent in supplementing, increasing, and practicing these qualities. We pray that we would be preparing for our departure, knowing, O oh God, that you are well able to glorify your name, not only through our lives, but through our deaths. And we thank you in advance for all that we have laid up for us in heaven. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what you have prepared 
to those who love you. And we do love you. And we bring out thanks in Jesus' great name. And all God's people say, Amen.